So, all right. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, we have uh, Shailaja Kopu, uh, who's going to be talking about CEP 33 uh, CIDR filtering authorizer. So I will, without further ado, I'll just let uh, Shailaja uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Shailaja Kopu. I'm a software engineer working for Apple. Uh, today, I'm presenting side of filtering authorizer that I have contributed to Cassandra um, as part of CP33. Um, I am sharing my screen. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. Oh, we don't see it yet, though. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, we can see it now. So here uh, to first uh, to explain what is CIDR filtering. Uh, CIDR is a IP range. Uh, so uh, we are restricting users access to Cassandra cluster from uh, uh, certain regions. Uh, the regions can be defined as a set of CIDRs. Uh, so I will show them, explain them using example later on, but uh, this is in high level. The main reason why are we having this feature uh, because nowadays, in the recent times, organizations are having Cassandra clusters uh, and uh, being accessed from multiple clouds. For example, an organization might, might be having internal data centers as well as using AWS, GCP, Azure, etc., different clouds as well. And they might be accessing existing clusters from different uh, cloud networks are also uh, deploying Cassandra clusters in their uh, one cloud and accessing from different regions. So I quickly show you an example here. For example, if you take the, uh, see this image, Cassandra cluster is um, deployed an internal network, but being accessed from AWS and GCP. In this case, security may need uh, may have two requirements. One requirement is uh, restricting users access uh, to the Cassandra cluster. Second requirement is restricting access to Cassandra, uh, certain Cassandra clusters when there are many more. Uh, for example, in the first uh, in the first case, the requirement one, if Cassandra cluster is being uh, shared from different teams, um, different teams ha are having different access requirements. For example, uh, team one is allowed to access uh, the cluster from AWS, but security doesn't allow team two to access uh, 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 the cluster from external networks, uh, they are, or if they are allowed to access only from internal networks. So this kind of requirement need to be met uh, in, as insider filtering authorizer allows rest restricting users access from particular uh, regions or CIDRs. As a second one is, for example, if internal network is uh, network is having uh, many Cassandra clusters, and uh, some of them need to be accessed from external networks, but not all of them, and opening ports of firewall may uh, uh, expose all these clusters out to the external world, and uh, which uh, which exposes uh, and puts uh, into the risk of uh, risk for other clusters as well. So in this case, the side of filtering authorizer can be used to uh, ensure that certain clusters are accessed only from internal network. Uh, these are exa uh, these are just few examples, but uh, uh, the overall feature is to uh, restrict users' access uh, from different uh, regions. And also there can be one other requirement, for example, super users' credentials usage from external networks is prohibited from security networks, for example. In that case, we can uh, ensure that super user credentials never work from external networks, always only works from internal network. For example, if uh, super user credentials are copied or hacked, uh, and uh, uh, letting them to work from external network can put clusters into the risk. That can be another example here. So our uh, primary audience of this feature are organizations with uh, on-premise data centers and uh, one, one or more external cloud environments and uh, organizations with uh, multiple U uh, teams sharing the uh, same Cassandra cluster. And uh, uh, there can be another case, organizations with Cassandra clusters running in the same network 
but being accessed from different regions. So here is how we implemented this feature. First, we uh, need to define CIDR group mappings. So uh, CIDR group here is a name that can be region name, or it could be AWS account, or it could be a simply a, a, any, any particular uh, a set of VPC or AWS account, anything, some virtual region you can you can have. And uh, for that, uh, we need to map them into an IP range. It can be one or more CIDRs. Here, uh, CIDR, actually in this case, if you see, uh, in this CIDR, the slash 16 means the first 16 bits are fixed. The remaining bits vary from zero, all zeros to all ones. So in this case, the CIDR 103000, to 1030 to 55 to 55 is the IP range. So this is how we define mappings of regions to the CIDR, a set of CIDRs. If you notice here, the CIDRs can be overlapping as well. For example, uh, this 1030 0016 is the broader IP range and whereas 1030 slash 24 is a narrower IP range. Uh, so it, to support these scenarios, we implemented uh, CIDR intervals tree and which supports uh, finding longest matching CIDR. For, uh, for example, in this case, the request is coming from the, uh, coming for IP 10.30.21, which is matching AWS and GCP. In this case, it will go and find out the narrower one. And there can be cases where uh, defining uh, IP particular IP range for a particular region may not be possible. For example, if for an organization, AWS, which is an external network, probably having a predefined uh, VPC ranges, uh, but internal may be very complicated because they are evaluate, evalu evaluating from many uh, decades as well. So in this case, the wildcard entry zero slash zero means anything which is not AWS GCP is not GCP is going to be internal. So if a request is coming from 11.30.20, which is not matching AWS, not matching GCP, then only it's, it's considered as internal. So there is a high, that, that's how we are supporting hierarchy of the CIDRs. Now, once we define the CIDR mappings, we need to uh, uh, we need we need the ability to map users to CIDR permissions. That means, for uh, for example, user uh, two should be allowed to access only from CIDR group AWS and GCP. So we should be able to define this kind of CIDR permissions, the CIDR uh, from which CIDR groups if certain users are allowed to access from. And also, for example, in this case, user one is allowed to access from any CIDR group. So not restricting from any CIDR group means they are allowed to access from anywhere. And by default, uh, when a user is created without any restrictions, they are allowed to access from any side of groups. That is a default. That means uh, in case of upgrades, uh, we don't need to worry about breaking existing users because they are allowed to access from any side of group as long as not restricted. And to be able to support this side of group permissions, we uh, modified create role and alter role SQL commands, which are existing SQL commands in Cassandra, uh, and added from CIDRs class. With this class, uh, we can uh, define from which CIDR groups this particular user is allowed to access from. And I will quickly give you a walkthrough of the demo. Are you able to see my IntelliJ? Yeah. You can see it. So this is a Cassandra um, repo, and we have uh, contributed this feature to 5.0 version. You can check out from GitHub Cassandra. And once you check out uh, in the AML file, this is where we define the con uh, configuration. Here, if you see the by default CIDR authorizer is allow all. That means access from any CIDR is allowed by default. Uh, that means uh, upgrade from older version works smoothly without any, uh, breaking anything. Um, but if, uh, once you want to define, uh, you want to enable CIDR authorizer, you just need to change this value. And by default, CIDR authorizer mode is monitor. That means, uh, that means 
Cider authorizer will not uh, reject any access from unauthorized cider group, but instead just locks a warning. So admins can have a look at uh, those uh, kind of unauthorized access and uh, uh, produce stats for them. And uh, but whereas in case of enforce mode, uh, the cider or the unauthorized cider access will be rejected. The reason why monitor mode is also provided. Uh, when before migrating to enforce mode, SRS probably want to understand which clusters are being accessed from which regions, or sometimes they simply probably need a stats of uh, different area, uh, regions or IP addresses the cluster is ac being accessed from. So for this uh, audit purpose also, uh, this monitor mode can be used. So, and there is, if you see, there is another option for enabling cider checks for super users by default, Cider checks for super users are not enabled, but to support the uh, one requirement that I mentioned, where we want to disable super user access from external networks. To meet such requirements, we can enable this feature. And just note that if, even when this feature is enabled, uh, cider checks won't happen for JMX calls. Once you uh, set up this uh, configuration, you can just start uh, one, one small thing. Uh, first, uh, to be able to enable CIDR authorizer, we need to have Cassandra authorizer and uh, authenticator enabled. We can just start the Cassandra. And then we can use the node tool command to uh, define CIDR mappings. For example, one example command. See here, I'm, def I'm saying that uh, the CIDR group AWS is CIDR uh, 172.17.0.0.16. I just took this simple IP, IP range because, sorry, my laptop is having only one IP, but that is a local IP. I just, uh, just to be able to give a demo, I'm choosing this one. So I define these cider groups. Now I can use node tool command. To, to see cider groups as well, which we have defined. Now I will show you how do we uh, internally maintain the cider groups in the SQL table. This is a system table that uh, maintains a cider groups that we have defined. So it shows what are the IP ranges that we uh, map to different IP, uh, internal cider group values. Uh, if you see, uh, we're actually using uh, uh, IP address uh, uh, data type of the CQL and the net mask. So the, we, we have not created any new data type for the cider for, to not break the existing clients. And if you see, Side of permissions currently, uh, there are no roles created with the uh, restricted side access. I'm creating a user called AWS user who is allowed access only from the side group AWS. Uh, so if you notice that before saying AWS here, we should be we should have node tool command ran already to define what is the side group AWS. Otherwise, system will reject saying that I don't know what is AWS here. I'm creating another GCP user who is allowed access only from GCP. I'm just creating one simple all user who is allowed to access from any CIDA group. That means uh, that user doesn't have any restriction, restrictions. So if you see CIDA permissions table now, this is having mapping of which user is allowed to access from which CIDA group. Now, once we have this defined,
now uh, let me try to access as a AWS user. This is okay. One minute. Oh, okay, sir. So actually, for me, the AWS is defined as the IP range starting from one seventy two, but whereas my IP is one twenty seven. So it's a, this is an error we get when we are attempting to access from a CIDR group which we are not authorized for. So AWS user is not or, or not allowed to access from this uh, particular IP range. Whereas if I try to access as a all allowed user, then I will be able to access. So this 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 works. Uh, if I try to access as a GCP user, I will be rejected because that will be expecting a IP range starting from 10 dot. So this says you do not have access from this IP. Let me uh, change the no tool command to, let me change the mapping for AWS to 127 something then Once we change the mapping, uh, we should be able to access as the AWS user. Now, as an AWS user, I'm allowed to access from 127 starting IP. So this is a simple uh, demo of how CIDR filtering authorizer works. Uh, there are different uh, options provided under it, so you can give it a try about them. Um, that's all about the about this demo. In case if we have time, I can walk you through the interval tree. How did we do on how what is a high level overview of the code as well? Do we have time for this? Yeah, yeah, go for it. <clears throat> or if you have any questions, I can take that up and then uh, after that I can answer. I, I can do the further walk. Uh, yeah, are there any, is there any questions so far? Okay. I think you're you're okay to uh, go ahead. Uh, so, in the Cassandra, when there is an incoming request, here we try to do the login, validate the login. Here we do authorization checks as well. Uh, here we come and see uh, is uh, we uh, the incoming address. The in the incoming request is having IP value and as well as the incoming user information we take that information we go and check is that user ha having access from that particular ip so here uh, to be able to achieve this here we are creating a, a cider interval tree uh, we'll show you the example here so here it looks like a cider interval tree uh, uh, from the narrows to broadest, we main we maintain ciders in the tree, uh, from top to bottom. That means the the reason why we have narrows at the top because, uh, the first match. For example, if I'm looking for some an IP starting with ten dot something, and if I, at level zero itself is matching, then I again exit the search. I don't need to go deep into the interval tree. Uh, so this is going to be very efficient because most of the time cider uh, input ciders won't overlap. The overlapping ciders are usually special cases and happens rarely. So most of that most of the time, the performance we get uh, with this lookup is going to be just a binary search of all the ciders at the same level. So in case if we don't find any match, then we go for next level. That means we keep going it into the broader cider. Uh, so this is simple interval tree, but there is a small hack, um, uh, which is an optimization for better performance. So for here, ideally, all the ciders with the you know, subnet mask of 20 have to be at level 0, and all the ciders with subnet mask of 10 have to be at level 1. But if there is no overlap at all for a particular cider range, then we promote them into the further level up so that we can have a a look up in a uh, look up uh, uh, a succeeding at the higher level itself so that we don't need to, we don't need to go down during the search 
So this is a uh, this is how interval tree is implemented, and the corresponding code is in the CIDR uh, interval tree CIDR groups mapping interval tree dot uh, file uh, in the repo. So you can have a look at this code, and uh, this uh, this tree is a maintained in, in memory, so it's completely cached. So there are. Uh, the uh, the only time the uh, disk uh, table is read uh, every few minutes or uh, maybe I think ideally by default every five minutes we read CIDR mappings from the table and rebuild this tree. So uh, that's the reason these lookups are quite faster. Performance uh, is going to be very good with that. And also we maintain a IP2 already found uh, CIDR group uh, uh, for that IP, I mean, cache of the IP to side a group. So that's going to be another level of the uh, cache lookup. So uh, the cache lookup for uh, side a group for IP is very efficient for that reason. And uh, we are we are also maintaining a side of permissions cache that is for a given role, a given role what are the side of groups uh, associated with them. So this cache also maintained. So that means when a request is coming, uh, when we are looking for uh, uh, this, when we are doing CIDR checks, we do use heavily use this cache and uh, we do best performance. So if you want to see the benchmark value here, this is the benchmark uh, of uh, interval tree. So if you see this interval tree, uh, when CIDR exists for a given IP value, uh, it's just a point, this, sorry, this one. This is in just uh, in nanoseconds of 28. Uh, and uh, not existing case is just around 23 nanoseconds. So it's, it's not a, a lot. And uh, another one, the benchmark for overall CIDR checks, uh, in case of valid login, that is when the login is approved, the it's in nanoseconds of 1076. And in case of invalid log login, it's around uh, 979 nanoseconds. And again, it's note that this, this latency, which is added, is not for uh, read write uh, path. It is only when the initial connection is established to the Cassandra server. Once the connection is established, once CIDR checks are done, read write doesn't have to go through this CIDR check. So the performance doesn't impact every read and write path. Yeah, that's all for me. Are there any questions? Yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to, I think you can just unmute yourself if you want, um, go ahead and ask questions. Uh, if not though, of course, we will post this on uh, the Planet Cassandra YouTube channel where everybody else can, can watch it. Um, yeah, but thank you so much for your presentation. I guess we don't have any questions this, this time, but I'm sure, of course, you're also on uh, the, um, the ASF Slack, so people can reach you there as well, right, if they have questions. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you so much for presenting. Really appreciate your time and uh, for for your insights and for your work. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. And um, yeah, see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you.